think that people who strive to gain social acceptance through their, they, although they're called non-violent or passive resistance, they're the most violent. Uh, I also think that uh, uh, it is uh, in violation to my civil rights if uh, someone can say, you must serve me if you own, if a man, if a man owns an eating establishment, uh, if he can't choose whom he pleases to ch serve or not to serve, that can affect me and you and anyone else. Well, it's just not the things we're used to down here. I mean, they come in and they sit down and we're not used to them sitting down beside us because I wasn't raised with them. I never have lived with them and I'm not going to start now. Television pictures of students mauled by mobs and manhandled by police stirred campus feelings from one end of the country to the other. My fellow Americans, I am about to sign into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Sports, as the saying goes, is a reflection of society. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act was signed by President Lyndon B. Johnson, legally ending segregation. With that being said, many sports leagues, pro and amateur, abided by Jim Crow. However, one man representing some obscure franchise called the Lakers courageously called out the injustice so many Americans faced every single day of their existence. Baylor number 22. That being Elgin Baylor. Born into segregation, Baylor is widely regarded as one of the greatest NBA players from DC. In 1958, after transferring to Seattle University, he led his team to the national championship game. That same year, with the number two overall pick, the then Minneapolis Lakers drafted Baylor. He made an immediate impact taking the Lakers to the finals, his rookie season, only to lose to, well, who else? The Boston Celtics in a sweep. It was what Elgin Baylor did that year that made him an undeniable hero. Charleston, West Virginia in 1959 was like many American cities, segregated. The Congress of Racial Equality launched sit-in movements at several Charleston lunch counters. This was prior to the famous Greensboro sit-ins. Some West Virginia businesses and even hospitals remained segregated into the late 1960s. A few businesses actually closed rather than admit blacks. So when a neutral site game between the Lakers and Cincinnati Royals took place in Charleston, West Virginia in 1959, Elgin Baylor took a stand because he was discriminated against based on his race. Via the Daily Republican, Baylor staged his sit-down strike after he and his two black teammates were refused admittance at a local hotel. He had told Lakers owner Bob Short after he had dealt with an incident of segregation in Charlotte that if it happened again, he would not play. We go up to the desk to register and I want to find out my room, Baylor recalled. The clerk said, the three colored boys will have to go somewhere else. Then the clerk turned to Lakers coach John Kunla and said, this is a nice respectable hotel and we can't take the colored boys. I love basketball. I like playing in the league very much, he said, but not at the expense of my dignity. He did not dress for the affair. Instead, he sat on the bench in street clothes and refused to step foot on the court, even saying at the time he would have surrendered his entire year's salary. After being implored and pressured to play by his teammates, he told Hot Rod Hunley, a white Laker who was from Charleston, the following. Rod, he said, I'm a human being. I'm not an animal put in a cage and let out for the show. They won't treat me like an animal. The American Business Club of Charleston and its promoter, H. Thomas Corey, sent a telegram to NBA President Maurice Podoloff, which read, urge disciplinary action against Elgin Baylor, who refused to play against Cincinnati here Friday. His absence from lineup, most embarrassing to us and damaged our chances of promoting future NBA games here. Afterwards, even with all the chatter, Baylor, stoic as ever, said the following, I'd do it again. After that night and the attention at game, the NBA commissioner decided no team would stay 
in any establishment that discriminated against their players. It was the first time the league had ever stepped out politically to say that it needed to be more than a profit machine and to actually stand with the black players who were starting to be central to the league's popularity. Locally, the response was huge. When the Lakers returned home to face Philadelphia at the Armory in downtown Minneapolis, they drew 7,156 fans in their previous home game against the Knicks. They had drawn 4,813. Everything that's happening today in social justice and everything that's happening on the court in basketball, an awful lot can be traced back to Elgin. It gives young people a personal way to understand the history of where all of this has come from and continues to be in the national discussion, said author Jen Bryan. It's remarkable to me that an athlete who was so ahead of his time on the court and off is as forgotten as Baylor, wrote the nation's Dave Zirin. One reason was that he was humble to a fault. As his old friend Jerry West said, he never, never called attention to himself. He was just infectious, quiet, and stately off the court. On March 22nd of 2021, Elgin Baylor passed away from natural causes. He was 86 years old. Via Zyron once more, if nothing else, his death should be a reminder that he belongs in the firmament of the all-time icons, both on and off the court. In a world bereft of heroes, Elgin Baylor built a pedestal of solid granite and a legacy that stands as an example for all of us, whether or not we've ever picked up a basketball.